Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, today I'm speaking with a few people regarding critical race theory and intersectionality in education, uh, mainly K through 12 and the effects that's having. So I'm speaking with Austin Omani, Ronald Fong, Glenn Miller, uh, Miller, sorry, and Chen Kwok. Hi everyone, thank you for coming on. And if you wouldn't mind just quickly introducing yourselves and go through some of the th stuff you're seeing. Ronald, I know you have to leave, so I'll start with you. Great. Uh, thanks a lot for the invite. I appreciate it. So I'm Ronald Fong. I'm a uh, volunteer for Californians for Equal Rights, which is the Proposition 16 out in California. And although I don't have K through 12 children, I do have a son who's attending Cal State Northridge. And recently they passed um, a bill about use, using certain ethics studies to try to broaden one's perspective. And again, um, whatever you see in the K through 12, they are really trying to also extend into their college levels. Yeah, recently with that, the, the UCs uh, made a move for that. Um, I think a judge ruled that the SAT had, and uh, the ACTs were considered, um, I don't wanna say racist, but at least uh, discriminatory. But there was also in California, wasn't there that, um, so it's passed, I think it's waiting to go on as a proposition. I don't know if that's the proposition you're talking about, where they, where they would make it no longer a crime to be prejudicial based on race or something along those lines. Yeah. So what it was was Proposition 16, and this is the genesis is back all the way to 1996, where California passed uh, Proposition 209. It passed by a 55 to 45 percent uh, outcome. And basically, Prop 209 was, uh, I think, the spiritual uh, lineage from the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And with Prop 209, it just said that uh, the, the state shall not discriminate nor give preferential treatment based on one's sex, race, national origin, or religion uh, for state employment or state admissions to the universities. That was what Prop 209 is. It you know, adds it to the Constitution. And now Prop 16 wants to take those very words out of the California Constitution. Okay, so basically covering themselves if something goes wrong. And I mean, you're seeing lawsuits in New York City, so they're, I guess they're trying to cover themselves for that. Right, so basically is that now you can give, you know, you're opening the door saying that you can make decisions in preferential treatment or discrimination based on a person's background. Okay, um, that's kind of scary. Uh, so, like, I just want to go around to everyone and get a quick overview of what's going on. And if you could, don't mind saying where you are. So, Asra, if you want to go next. Sure. Thanks so much, Obed, for having me speak and join you all today. You know, we we oftentimes talk about a much more different topic related to Islam and Islamic ideology, um, but what I'm honored to speak with you all today because what we have seen today is a new ideology that is infusing itself in our education system from kindergarten to postgraduate school. And I'm a mother in Northern Virginia to a son who is a senior any day now as school begins at a school named Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. U.S. News and World Report called it America's number one high school this year, and that put a target on our backs. We have mostly Asian, mostly immigrant families. My family came from India, and what we are facing, as Ronald has talked about in California, and Chen will talk about in New York City, is an attempt to change the school so that we have race-based outcomes. And, and I'd love to talk to you, we're gonna talk more about that, but it's a really disturbing, frightening scenario that challenges the entire ethos of America system of meritocracy. Yeah, I, that's, that's very well put. I mean, I've, I've been reading this stuff for like I literally, I've, I think I've warped my brain with critical race theory and intersectionality for the last two years. And it's just awful. I mean, and they say it straight out. I mean, Kimberly Crenshaw in Mapping the Margins in the last couple of paragraphs says that the ethic of liberalism, which took the focus away from identity, was wrong and that you need a new identity-based politics for people of color. And 
I mean, it's and that's the way it's been focused since then. So yeah, it's 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 scary. Um, Glenn, if you wouldn't mind just going next and just giving a big brief about where you're from. Yes, uh, uh, Glenn, Glenn Miller here. I also uh, have a uh, have a child, a son, uh, at Thomas Jefferson uh, High School for Science and Technology in uh, in Northern Virginia, uh, and and uh, I'm friends with Osrin, and and I'm dealing with the uh, the same issues. Uh, and uh, my my background, I went to uh, attended Harvard Law School uh, in the uh, late '80s and early '90s. At a point in time in which uh, 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 the foundations, many of the of what you see now with critical race theory, was was prominently uh, discussed. Uh, we had Derek Bell there at the time. Uh, uh, Bar- Barack Obama was a year ahead of me, uh, and uh, and there were there was quite a lot of discussion about critical race theory, about deconstruction, uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, the the foundations of what you now see. Uh, around the country, in terms of what uh, of, of what critical race theory uh, 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 meant, what critical race theory's goals were, uh, and uh, where critical race theory ultimately will be going, and it's it's disheartening for me to uh, have uh, see what what 30 years ago was uh, what then a fringe movement, which I regarded as as uh, as as being a, a very very uh, Inconsistent with a lot of the principles that uh, this this country were, were was based on, such as individual liberty, equality, etc. I mean, these core uh, principles uh, and are thrown out the door uh, with critical race theory in the form of uh, of, of, of moral relativism, uh, and it's disturbing and disheartening to see only 30 years later what then was an isolated academic exercise now being placed uh, in uh, in our in our schools and our in our kindergartens in uh, uh, and in everyday life in our in our society and in politics it's disheartening and it's it's all the more disturbing when when I I know from from my experience back in, in law school know exactly where if left unchecked critical race theory will take us and it's and it's a it's quite a dystopian vision of the future unfortunately yeah, thanks for that. I mean, it's uh, good to get a background on that because I mean, I've, re- I've read Bell and I've you know read some of the critical legal scholarship as well, and yeah, I understand. Like, I'm gonna just go off on a tangent here. Like in Bell's paper, uh, "Serving Two Masters," when he says that they should have desegregated education, not schools, I get what he was trying to get at, but then he just takes that core of an idea that's not so bad and just pushes straight for keep it segregated. And, you know, and that, and base everything on race, and that's where it gets scary. Um, so, yeah, just give me a sec. Yeah, Chen, if you don't mind, you know, letting people know where you're from and what you're seeing, and then I thought after that we could maybe go th- if if you guys wanted to just talk a bit about specific things that you're seeing, like policies that are being put in place and things like that. Yes, uh, thank you. Good to meet you all. Some I've met before, but uh, for, for um, uh, Obeid and and Ron. It's Ronald, right? It's Donald? Ron- Ronald, correct. Yeah, sorry. Um, the, uh, so, so I'm from New York City. I'm a public school parent. Um, I grew up in New York, New York City. Um, I went to, I was a graduate of one of the schools that are being targeted, uh, specialized high schools, uh, Brooklyn Tech, uh, back, in the, back in the 80s. Um, and uh, what, they're, what they're looking at is uh, the unfortunate results after like 20 straight years of uh, high numbers of Black and Hispanics being in the specialized high schools, uh, disappearing the past 20 years. Um, and now they're saying that uh, because there are so few, uh, from a percentage-wise, uh, Black and Hispanics now in the specialized high schools, that the single test that's been in use for about you know 70 years, even predating some laws, um, is discriminatory, and the effect is discriminatory. Therefore, it is racist. Um, so there have been multiple efforts through the years, uh, through the past 10 years at least. I mean, I came back from working overseas and living overseas about, uh, three or five years ago, you know, and uh, when I came back, I was shocked to find the, what's come, what's become. And previous years, they've had efforts to um, to take away the test, um, to use multiple criteria. And the latest one was from the mayor um, who said, you know, 7% from the top st- uh, students by grade from all the schools should be able to be given entree 
which on the surface sounds nice, but the disparities in education quality across all the schools in New York City is high. Uh, there's a lot of grade fraud and, and uh, that, that happens, grade inflation. So school A and B are very different even if the kids get A's. And there's some schools where the kids are high performing and they all get hot, score very high on the standardized um, tests, math tests and English tests. So 90% of the kids are doing, uh, will, you know, will be disqualified because of that, just because of that arbitrary 7%. So the you know the fight has been over that, and uh, originally you know my 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 entry into it is like well it's not fair we need to have meritocracy uh, and we need to address the underlying issues of the, the education you know quality um, and so forth that you know the kids like black and Hispanics in New York City um, only thirty percent of them are at grade level proficiency right um, and that's that means seventy percent are not doing well and that's a that's a crisis. But they attack certain schools that are you know, maybe one percent of the population instead of focusing on, you know, of, uh, larger varieties. So, it, you know, they're also now attacking schools that are uh, academically rigorous. So, um, you know, their programs such as gifted and talented, uh, and also uh, academically rigorous, academically rigorous middle schools, uh, that that you need to have good grades and good performance. Uh, and they group the kids, so to speak, you know, by default, then by, by performance. So they're against that too. So now, because also discrepancies, and instead of, and part of it is they they took away a lot of these programs in the last 20 years um, uh, to be feel like very much fewer. And the issue really is ac uh, academic opportunities for all students, instead of, to, you know, um, giving out the uh, the places by race. And then after a while, I finally, you know, looking around the country looking at what's happening in Virginia, looking at what's happening in California, and this whole critical race theory, it kind of finally dawned on me. Like, they're not after academic, you know, improvement. Because none of the discussions talk about that. It's all about how to divvy up the seats by race. And that, it, you know, struck me. And it's in un the critical race theory, and, and, you know, they're based on Marxism. And I call it Marxist racism, basically, because they want to, and affirmative action is also that. So it's kind of dawned on me, like, you know, we, we, it's like you have to argue on two points. One is you have to you do have to argue on the academic aspect. We want to close the achievement gap. Um, you know, like I'm a big per, I'm a big supporter of school choice because it has shown to do wonders and high, you know allow low income Black and Hispanic families and their children to have a, a quality education and they have shown to perform very well. Um, but but the other aspect is to push back on this Marxist social uh, Marxist racist um, you know critical race theory. And they're not only doing it on the testing, testing schools, but also in the curriculum. They're, they've introduced a thing called um, culturally responsive and sustaining education, which on the surface wants to teach kids about, you know, other kids' cultures and heritage, which is fine. You know, when I was an immigrant, you know, newly immigrant coming to the schools, my mom asked the principal, how come there's no Asian history or Chinese history taught, which is great. But they're actually going to teach kids how to hate each other because, because the anti-racism means that, the, the Kendi anti-racism means that there's no way for the white kids not to be racist, right? So you're going to teach the kids that, that all white kids are racist by default, and there's nothing they can do about it. So that's a danger as well. So I'll give it back to you guys. Uh, I just want to ask you one thing about New York City, because I've I followed New York City a little bit closely. Um, mm -hmm. Now, it was last year, I believe, that they started putting in a policy where Students of color, if they were late or if they handed in assignments late, the administrators and the teachers were told to give them a break because it's not culturally sensitive to make sure they stick to a schedule. Um, uh, I don't think that's happened, but there there is such thing as great inflation um, and what they call restorative justice practices, where if a you know kid is not behaving you know or, or is assaulting other kids. Um, they've taken much lower, like, you know, lowered down uh, reaction, not sending them away to another school, no suspensions. So the stats don't look good, so they want to raise the stats instead of addressing the, the root cause. Um, lowering standards is done for the, um, you know, from the grade level, the, the GPAs, right? Um, so there are cases that's well published, uh, places like New York Post, um, that there's great fraud that, kids are graduating without having finished the required work um, that that has been documented and there's supposed to be investigations but they haven't gone anywhere okay because I mean like I said I've been following some of this and I'd heard about that I'd heard that they, they told administrators to do that I mean I saw what's his name Carenza at a, I saw Carenza at a meeting or a conference or something he was on stage 
And he he was saying that that punctuality and keeping to a schedule is a manifestation of whiteness. Yes, so, that's what I mean, he teaching. was telling. I, I don't know if it was a board. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're teaching that in so, the in the training for the educators in, in the implicit bias training. Yes, and they had on a big yeah. screen. So the, that's what I was getting at. Like they yes, they're kind of. Yes. Yeah, they're doing that right now. Yeah. They've been I'd doing that. I'd love for Ron. To students. I'd love for Ron to weigh yeah. in too about the stories of his families in California, but you know. What is happening is an erasure of the stories of remarkable people, including people in our white communities and our Asian communities. The white communities are being disparaged as white supremacists and racist, intrinsically part of this systemic racist system that they put forward as the crux of critical race theory. But how do we as Asians lose our identities? we become called white adjacent. And mm -hmm. so let me tell you, my father, he climbed a bunion tree in India as a boy to cheer Mahatma Gandhi as he fought against British colonial rule. My father is five foot three because he survived the Bengal famine when food was diverted from the subcontinent. And he literally remembers the scratch of the sorghum wheat that Indians received as aid. And he is grateful ultimately for surviving. And his mission was to serve humanity. And that is the mission with which he came to America and educated himself, educated me. And I was just a young English as a second language girl literally eating the free breakfast because we were so poor that when you turn on the lights in our kitchen, you know, in the school, in the house that I grew up in, you waited. We always waited for the cockroaches to disappear. You know, that's what we come from. And so the fact that my son worked hard, I raised him to value education, and he entered into this. Okay, the fact that my son worked hard and my father then, when my son walked in through the doors of Thomas Jefferson High School, my father stood there with such joy in his heart because this was the journey of two generations, three generations, and so many more before us who worked hard. And, and it is to me such a moral crime that our families are now sitting with targets on their backs, we should, in fact, celebrate them. Yeah, totally. Um, look, I, I, I don't want me to cut you off so quickly, Oscar, but Ronald, I know you got to go, so if you want to give a bit, brief description of what's going on in California, like like what kind of policies you're seeing um, like th through the education system um, or anything else you want to discuss. Yeah, I know this is mostly through K through uh, 12, and uh, Ashra and I did have a conversation about that, about Americans of Asian descent and what their identity is. And so many times this uh, second or third generations really lose their identity because they may not speak the language, they not have contact with their parents or the pioneers. And in their quest for success, then they do you know, latch on to certain models. And once they get into academia, it's gonna be a more liberal model. And I think that's where you know the quote unquote Asian American identity is. And again, I know this is more K through 12, but uh, what you see in K through 12, what you see in undergrad, and also what you see in my field uh, as a physician, I used to be on faculty at UC Davis, is medical education. And think about this, uh, you know, your time is very tight during medical education and also residency. And yet, instead of the basics, you know, fundamentals, physiology, um, pharmacology, there are many things now about uh, cultural appropriation or cultural sensitivity, sensitivity. And somehow that the thought is you cannot be a good physician to another person based on the fact that you care about the other person. If you come from a divergent background, a divergent you know, physical characteristics, somehow you're gonna be deficient as a healer. And that's what's really being taught at the uh, you know, higher educational levels. And you could see also that's an extension of what's being taught at K through 12 and through your undergrads. So many times now, uh, students have been uh, encouraged to become ex very uh, uh, activated, uh, politicized and so forth in terms of uh, the spectrum of medical education in terms of medical care. 
So I think that it's important now, the outgrowth of this is that you're going to see politics be more involved every time you go to your physician's office. Yeah. Okay, look, I, I'm 100% behind what you're saying because K through 12 is important as that's developing kids, but this has been in the academy, you know, for a while. I mean, the, the, the ideas of like repressive harm through critical theory have been in the academy since 85. And so colleges of education. So people who go through undergrad and masters and doctorates are the ones who become teachers and, you know, train the instructors and all that. So I've been reading up on health equity and that's scary is, you know, that I don't want my doctor to be my doctor because he's the same skin color as me. I want my doctor to be my doctor because they're qualified. Like that, that's all I care about. You know, I don't care about anything else. Um, yeah, the the Asian thing, it's, it's. I mean, I, there was a meeting in Toronto about four weeks ago about brown complicity with white supremacy. <clears throat> and it was two South Asians and one Middle Easterner. Uh, there was a letter from Yale recently by uh, Asian students. It was basically, dear parents, why are you all so racist? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous. Like, I'm sorry, if I had kids in Yale and they sent me a letter like that, I would sue Yale. Like, what are you doing? What are you teaching my children? You know, like, I, I, I don't know why there's no more lawsuits. Pardon? It's education malpractice. Yeah. Now, imagine a white person saying that I won't see a doctor because the doctor is black and I want to see a white doctor. Can you imagine that? Again, that goes back to critical race theory. It depends on who you look at it. Kendi's the only one who says black people can be racist towards white people, but then he goes on to say because white people as a group are in power and black people as a group have been oppressed, that racism never doesn't count. All the other critical race theorists and the anti-racists say that you can never be racist against white people. So it doesn't matter. I mean, it's... And then, you know, if you're brown or you're, you know, you're... you're South Asian or you're Asian, I, I, these, these identities suck. Um, you know, you're white adjacent or you, you, you've taken on whiteness. Um, but well, that, uh, that, that's, Oscar, the only way, that's the only way for the theory to, to really be able to hold itself together. I mean, they have to create exceptions yeah. to, to, to rules. They have to accept, they have to, uh, critical race theory has to create, create exceptions to, to the, uh, to the rules uh, on which the country was based, which is uh, equality, uh, liberty, etc., uh, personal responsibility, and if they if they don't create exceptions to those rules, uh, they they end up uh, th their philosophy ends up becoming incredibly internally in inconsistent, which of course it is. But ultimately, when when you read Ibram Kendi or one of these other groups arguing that that blacks can never be racist, he has to do that because he's because he's ultimately trying to excuse uh, excuse racism. When he says be an anti-racist, it means be a reverse racist. I mean that's essentially what Kendi preaches. Um, and um, but but ultimately, ultimately, the irony of the of 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 the uh, of the whole process is that ultimately, as you as you've seen from the from the power of Black Lives Matters and some of the other movements, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, these groups do have power in our country. And and so the argument that uh, that they they that these groups can't be racist because they don't have power is belied by the fact that they do have incredible power right now. And so either either that. Uh, uh, philosophy of of uh, I can't be racist because I have no power uh, is 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 wrong intellectually or in practice it's also wrong because of course they have power and ultimately as you see uh, as you see uh, 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 groups and cancel culture and the like attacking particular uh, particular groups of, of of people and have have been uh, attacking uh, uh, you know uh, a, a comp you know, uh, merit for, for years, you're, you're now seeing the same sorts of attacks on merit uh, uh, m moving against uh, successful uh, uh, Asians. It's just only a matter of time. And ultimately, it's 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 closely veiled uh, anti-Semitism because you see some of the same attacks historically against uh, against Jews because Jews uh, have uh, have been uh, you know, historically successful. I mean, Harvard and Yale back in the uh, you know, in the uh, in the early part of the century, uh, uh, discriminated against uh, uh, Jews because the, uh, for the same argument that you see now against Asians, which is, oh, if we don't do something, we'll that will be, you know, most of the class will be will be Jewish, and so it's 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 a it's a 
retreading of the same tired philosophy that has been that you've seen in the past. It's so important. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Oh, please go ahead. I think it's uh, interesting we talk about this, and I guess what's going around is like uh, two plus two is the new five. Uh, I think everyone's heard about that, and how math is now deemed racist. Uh, and I think the idea of having you know an objective standard, and it's amazing to me. And I was having this uh, conversation at Azra when I was working with medical students and residents. The math illiteracy, even at that level. Is astounding, and I've had uh, residents and med students who just tell me I'm not a numbers person. And I said, how can you be a STEM field and not be a numbers person? That's just you know astounding. Uh, okay. and, and, and before we before we make rounds or uh, when I began a rotation, I would give them a relatively straightforward math problem. If Bob can mow the lawn in 30 minutes and Jim can mow the lawn in 45 minutes, how long will it take them to mow the lawn together? And they would just look at me perplexed by saying, what's this guy do with medicine? And I said, well, for you not to understand that there is a problem here. And I said, can you just do this? And they go, well, that was back in, you know, in eighth grade, ninth grade algebra. I go, OK, so you've had this. This is not unfamiliar. And then the idea that they could not be mentally flexible in terms of understanding, you know, how to approach a problem in math. I said, if you can't tell me how long it's going to take two guys to mow a lawn together, how can I trust you to make the right dosage of medications for a, for a patient? Okay, the math thing. You gotta. The way it works is this: it's not that two plus two has to equal five. It's that two plus two equals four. Is if you can change those, they're playing stupid word games. You can change the conditions. So you say if we're gonna round off. So 2.4 plus 2.4 equals 4.8. But if you round, then it's 2 plus 2 equals 5. Right? It's They're saying if you set the conditions, you can make 2 plus 2 equal anything. It, it doesn't have to equal 5. It's saying making it equal 4 is racist because that is a white way of knowing. And science and objectivity is whiteness. I'm going to link to a, a seminar that's being given. Um, this is to take out white supremacist. Uh, thinking in schools. This is a workshop that's given. One of the things, that, some of the things they list are objectivity, individualism, worship of the written word. <laughs> like these are white supremacist tendencies. So the two plus two equals four is because they're saying science, objectivity, mathematics, those are white ways of knowing. There are other ways of knowing, and these other ways of knowing are just as equal and just as valid. So, so that's I where the that yeah. comes from. It's it, it two. Go ahead. Let me just give some context. What they what they have done in critical race theory is steal a fundamental uh, approach of the field called cross cultural communications because that's what I studied at American University and got a graduate degree from sort of the godfathers of cross cultural communications. And the model there is that there's two types of cultural communications. One is called high context, which is people who are very relational and contextual. And the second is low context cultures that are very linear and direct. And so what they have assigned to low context cultures is white supremacy. They've simply stolen this, this divide of, of cultural experiences. But that divide of cultural experiences can be can manifest itself across race lines. So, for example, a white young man raised in South, in the American South can be all about relationships and and who does his dad know and who does his mom know, but a white kid from Boston may be very linear and direct. And so, cross culturally, it, it's unbelievable what they have done. And, and ultimately why every single person who is listening should care is because this, uh, this kind of understanding of humanity and society is being weaponized to have, an, have a war on education. This is really a war on education. This is a war on critical thinking and this is a war on knowledge. Um, the perfect example that Ron provided is the one in which STEM and math and science are under attack. There is literally a website that's called um, uh, STEM is Racist. And they do not want to value 
the education and actually put responsibility on our school districts and our schools for failing to educate those minority groups that are not succeeding in these fields numerically. Um, and, and that's really a failure. If you care about race relations in this country, if you care about the black and Hispanic communities and other underrepresented minorities in these fields, then we should hold the educators responsible for educating people on the basic basis um, pr basic principles of math, science, English, and all the other fields that they may be represented in. Uh, and, and if you do but, not, but, but you're just accepting the lazy approach. Uh, the the, the anti-Semitism that you brought up, just because I saw this this morning, and it's from that book, uh, Defense of Looting or whatever, the one that just came out that NPR did the interview with, there's a, there's a, uh, a section in that um there's a section in that book where they, I'm turning my camera off, uh, where they said, they're talking about the riots, the Rodney King riots and the Korean grocers yeah. defending their you know, their stores. Then they also mentioned about Jews. And they said, well, the Jews and the Koreans are the face of capitalism. And this was in defense of looting. I mean, Derek Bell wrote a play called Space Traders. And this was about aliens coming to Earth and they offer gold for all the black people, and Jews broker the deal. And this puts whiteness on Jews. During the riots right after George Floyd, there were synagogues that were burnt in L.A. and defaced in L.A. And they said, well, Jews have taken part in the slave trade. They've taken on whiteness. Property is whiteness. It's, it's, it's not a good thing. <laughs> Is, is, is anybody surprised? Of, of, uh, they shouldn't be. I mean, you shouldn't be surprised that STEM is under attack. You shouldn't be surprised that standardized tests are under attack, because ultimately critical race theory says that, that they don't have to demonstrate intent. They don't have to demonstrate uh, anything other than, uh, than uh, uh, that any, anything that shows any differences between uh, races uh, in terms of pra practical outcome, be they standardized tests, be they educational accomplishment, be they, be they the free market, uh, be they, be they the STEM field where there are, there are insufficient numbers of uh, of blacks and Hispanics in in some of the 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 high the tech companies, Apple and Google and Facebook, despite the fact that those companies are 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 avowedly woke, um, and th there's only so much these groups can do to try to convince people that they're all just implicitly racist and that, and that the, the reason for, uh, uh, for these discrepancies is that you don't realize you're racist, you're implicitly racist, but ultimately uh, the, the implicit race, racism argument only goes so far. And the only thing left uh, to do is to attack the messenger, is to attack standardized tests, attack STEM, uh, attack the scientific method, and of course, it, then you attack the free market because the free market is ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, the the ultimate uh, indicator of, of of discrepancies because there are differences in terms of economic outcome of, of people. Yeah. Yeah. And anything that shows yeah. any sort of a, of a of a difference is is per se systemically racist under their theory, and is yeah. and is subject to an all out attack. Is being racist. So, so I would like to just add uh, two points to that. Uh, one is, I think the there are also co-conspirators in this. <clears throat> I look at the teacher unions as a co-conspirator because they are fighting tooth and nail against standardized tests, because they the standardized tests reveal how in, so insufficient uh, or deficient they are in educating our kids. Uh, when you have only 70, 30 percent of Black and Hispanic kids in New York City proficient at grade level, in the um, government schools that are taught by union teachers versus, um, you know, 90% of black and Hispanic kids who are majority of the students at charter schools like Success Academy uh, being high performing. It just shows you that, um, you know, of the utter failure, but they want to hide the evidence. And the same thing for, uh, and then for the standardized test, the other one is, you know, obviously the schools now lack, a, you know, if they don't have SATs anymore, they can hide the evidence of discrimination against Asians or other groups. Uh, the, the, I guess the, um, yeah, I had a point on the second one that, that I wanted to say um, about the, you know, the critical race theory. Um, you know, the the best, you know, I think the, what I've read, you know, to counter this is people like Thomas Sowell, right? 
you know, he has a book, uh, you know, has many books on on this topic, you know, that they've, you know, discrimination disparities, you know, talking about um, just because you see an outcome that looks um, that have dis disparate outcomes, uh, it doesn't mean that it's it's racism that's behind it. You know, different groups have different, even even within families under the same roof, the same background, they'll have disparate results within among siblings, uh, and so forth. So, and it's also, you know, kind of a fallacy related to uh, what they say about correlation and causation, right? Um, disparities of outcome does not necessarily mean uh, racism, and and you know, correlation does not mean causation. Yeah. But um, ultimately. Ultimately, the, the the other the the other defense against critical race theory, which is a more uh, broad based attack on on the flaw of critical race theory, is that ultimately um, the human human beings are, are are tribalistic. I mean, human beings are ultimately just in the natural state. They they tend to to band around families and nations and people that that are like them. And 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 that sort of tribalism is something that that modern liberalism has has fought against for years to try to 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 to, to for our civilization to go past that. It's because of of uh, appealing beyond tribalism and beyond uh, race uh, and getting past that that we've been able to 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 achieve some of the great accomplishments of the 20th century in terms of the civilization, the Civil Rights Act. Uh, uh, gay rights, all of the all of the things that that you see with modern liberal, liberal, liberalism, but those have been achieved not because of identity, but in spite of it, by yes. by by appealing to common beliefs and commonalities and persuasion as opposed to power. And ultimately, uh, if, you, if, if you think about the 14th Amendment and the uh, and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, that was designed to reinforce uh, the the liberties and and the these common goals that the that the United States was was founded on, which we you know over the years has not necessarily always been uh, 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 been able to achieve those ideals. Slavery being the most obvious example, but ultimately the United States has always strived to to be there. But ultimately, the tragedy of of uh, of woke progressivism, identity politics, whatever you call it. Uh, is that that by by appealing to uh, back to tribalism to uh, to identity and and, and uh, uh, to giving up the advantages and the and the accomplishments of liberalism and appealing back to tribalism, they risk uh, having the, uh, the these these same forces of tribalism ultimately uh, c come back into vogue. And ultimately, uh, if you think about it from the standpoint of the United States. The, the risk there is that 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 the uh, that if we go back to tribalism, some of the very uh, people that have the most to lose from tribalism uh, are are the minority groups, or are the disadvantaged minority groups who who for, for whom the Fourteenth Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause were originally designed to protect, and to the extent that they they give away and 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 push back against those very protections to them, they are at the most risk of losing. The liberties and the civil rights and the and the accomplishments that we've fought so hard over the last sixty years to to get, and I find it I find it ironic. Yeah, uh, it, I mean it's crazy. I just want to mention one thing about budgeting just for a second, and then I'd like to see what you guys think, like how you're trying to fight back or what your suggestions are, especially for public schools here. The budgeting, the thing I'm talking about, I I. I've been speaking with this uh, woman on uh, on Twitter. I've, I've spoken with her on my podcast. She's a teacher out of Texas. She started this thing called clearthelists.org. Now, it's an organization where teachers can make wish lists, and they're asking for stuff like pencil sharpeners and you know, just basic school supplies. In the public school system, I mean, I don't know how much these administrators and these diversity trainers are making. I mean, you see how much Robin D'Angelo is making. If you can't put pencil sharpeners in the classroom, how can you justify paying six figures to one of these people? That, as you said, Glenn, they're they're causing nothing but division. I have a friend of mine; his kids are half Asian. He's like they're mixed race. He's white. His wife's Asian. They came home one day. He wrote about this, uh, and they came home one day wishing that they weren't part white. That's not healthy children. So you're wasting money on this kind of stuff, but you can't put pencil sharpeners in schools. Yeah, like it's would... it, it's insane. 
They're, yeah, they, they're like, teaching you know, kids to hate each other and to hate themselves. Yeah. Sorry. It's a pathology that's being taught now in our in our school systems. And just to bring it home, <clears throat> we're sitting in Fairfax County, Virginia, Glenn and I, um, where our boys are going to school. It is a three billion dollar budget that the school has, and yet they put pay freezes right on the teacher salaries. They are, you know, pinching pennies here and there. But this summer, they spent twenty thousand dollars for Ibrahim Kendi to literally do a Zoom call for sixty minutes and indoctrinate the leaders of our Fairfax County public school system with his ideology. And why it's so dangerous, like to to reflect on what Glenn's point was earlier about the tribalism and Chen's point, you know, about the danger on all of this. They have argued for many years that there is a hierarchy of human value <clears throat> in which blacks are low. But what they have done is they are flipping this hierarchy of human value to basically demean and and diminish so many people in our society. And that is not humanist. That's ultimately what is such a betrayal to liberal values with this philosophy and this ideology that is more like a cult. They are not humanist. And that is really the reflection that I hope your listeners will have about this indoctrination that's happening in our school systems. It is expensive. It's taking away critical education dollars, and it's ultimately creating a toxicity in our children's psychology. And, and that is something that we cannot allow. We must protect them, and we must advocate for our children's well-being. And this is a violation of their well-being, and so we have to fight for their health and wellness. Yeah, 100%. I mean... I'll give you another anecdote. These are obviously anecdotes. A friend of mine, he's got a son who's four years old. So he took his son to go Halloween shopping. Now, it wasn't his son who said this, but he saw two other kids who he said were about eight or nine years old. They went to their their kids' parents, picked up a costume, and one of the kids said, I can't wear that. That's offensive. An eight-year-old should not be thinking about that. You know, an eight-year-old, yes, shouldn't go out and purposely be offensive. But, you know, if you got a white son and he wants to dress up as Mulan, who cares? You know, like you shouldn't care about these things. You know, an eight-year-old should not have to think about what is offensive and what isn't. That way. <laughs> the other aspect is for the you know black and brown kids. You know, there's a um, victimhood you know mentality that's going to perpetuate with this. Um, in addition to you know attacks on other other groups like Asians and whites. Um, and for in terms of for affirmative action, we have seen clear examples of, you know, in Malaysia, uh, the majority ethnic Malays instituted, uh, the government instituted a uh, pro-Malay, um, ethnic Malay uh, policy since the 60s. Um, and, you know, by law prohibited um, ethnic Chinese Malaysians from being certain jobs and in certain industries and so forth. And with the thought of helping the, the ethnic Malaysians, well, uh, after all these years, 50, 60 years later, uh, the, the Malaysian ethnic Malay performance economically and educationally is still lagging behind um, the, the the you know the Chinese ethnic Chinese. So there's, there's you know there's proof that you know um, around the world that you know these policies of pre preferential and race based policies um, just don't work you know and and time merit. So those are you know examples we could we could point to in terms of you know as well outside the country that show that this it doesn't work. It's it's failing. And it is failing for America for affirmative action. I mean, ultimately, okay. uh, it ultimately, the, the, it seems to be the only way to really push back on this is is to appeal uh, appeal to the uh, se sensibility of of people and that and for people to have courage to speak out. Uh, ultimately, the the way critical race theory uh, uh, stays alive and allows itself to flourish. Uh, is uh, is not based on on the the reason the logic of its reasons and 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 uh, and by persuasion um, uh, it, it's by power and it's by threats and and that's where cancel culture comes in because it's it's right out of the the, the critical race theory playbook which is that is that uh, 
the, the, the way to, to, to win the argument is to intimidate people and threaten people and, and be personal with people who disagree with you, and then nobody will argue with you. And, and so the, the only way for people to ultimately uh, to win the argument is to have courage and to speak up. And I think one of the one of the uh, one of the the the, the, the groups that, uh, at least in my experience with with the schools, has been shown more courage, frankly, than than uh, some of the people in the uh, in uh, some of the other ethnic groups, such as uh, my my own uh, gr <laughs> group of uh, Caucasians, is uh, is, uh, is is Asian people who have who have uh, uh, shown the, the willingness uh, to. To, to take on the system, immigrants, people who are who have known what it's like to be under Marxism and communism, uh, who've known what it's like to be living through the Cultural Revolution, which is the same sort of anti-merit, anti-intellectual foundations of critical race theory, which is Marxism, uh, and to sh and to share their experiences and say, look, I I'm I'm an immigrant, I'm from China, or I'm from Malaysia, or I'm from India wherever to say that this is this is what is the ultimate outcome of cultural revolutions or uh, or the, the, the you know Marxism it's it's forced equality it's anti-intellectualism uh, it's all these bad things can, that can result and you have to show courage and to be able to talk about your experience and hope hopefully win win the battle of persuasion uh, against power thanks. Asra, if you have any, like, if you have, also, I know you're working on a list. If you have any resources or anything you might be able to give people or. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Glenn put it really beautifully, which is just like we all face moments in our lives when we have to decide whether we're going to take a stand. This is the moment that we're in, in our history and in our country. Will you have the moral courage to stand up against an ideology of indoctrination and cultish thinking that is trying to put toxic ideas in the minds of our beautiful children? If you refuse such indoctrination, then please push back in your communities, whether you're just a public citizen without children in the community Watch the school board meetings. Listen to the tweets that they are putting out. Read the curriculum changes that are happening. From New York City to Virginia and California, we have parents and students and alumni mobilized in our Northern Virginia community. Glenn and I came together with many other parents who have come together with great courage in their lives. They are people who fear losing their jobs. Like Glenn said, they have lived through the cultural revolution. We have a mom who marched in Tiananmen Square and she's literally having flashbacks now in America to the trauma that she experienced in China. But we came together in our community, we created an organization called Coalition for TJ, the nickname for our school, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. You can find the coalition on all the social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Coalition for TJ. You can email us at coalitionfortj at gmail.com. One of these days soon, we'll have a website up. And Around the country, you can support us because this isn't just a fight within one school district and one school. This is a fight for all of America and the future of America and, and the, our ability to have both moral, a moral compass that is strong and solid and an educational system that allows us to compete at the highest levels with the other countries of the world. And ultimately, to me, a social justice arena that is humane to all. And so I hope everybody will join us. I hope they will support the parents in New York City, the parents in California, and the parents all across the school, dis the school districts of the United States as they try to fight for the hearts and souls of our children. And of, yeah, of I'm course, gonna, their I'm minds. Gonna, I'm gonna you know, reiterate something you said. Uh, a woman I know, for, again off Twitter, I've interviewed her. She was a lawyer in Canada. She took on the Ontario, it's kind of like a bar association, 
but she found out about the social justice stuff that was coming into the law society. So she went to the meetings and then she got, she saw that there was only about four or five people who would show up that would push this stuff. So she got and got eight of her friends to show up with her and then they just voted it down. So go to the school board meetings, go to your school council meetings, show up. There. This is a very, very small minority, but they're loud and they're vocal and no one else has the time to go. So you just need about 10 people and you can vote this stuff down. It's all you need. So, so in you know, so in New York City, um, in the fight uh, to protect the, um, the specialized high schools, you know, many parents, you know, for the first time became active politically, went on the streets to protest, went to uh, city council hearings. Um, we started participating in the local school boards, which you know are a little bit different now from the other school boards around the country, but still have a influential, uh, some influence, soft, you know, influence over policy um, and you know we urge you know and we have WeChat groups uh, uh, WeChat groups and also we have a website and you know so one of the things we did was also to have a, a educationally based grouping uh, and we formed a group called uh, Place NYC for parent leaders. Um, uh, uh, Sorry uh, that was Placing NYC? Yeah placenyc.org is our website p-l-a-c-e-n-y-c.org uh, and we are parent leaders for accelerated um, education, uh, curriculum and education. Uh, so we are really advocating for you know improved education opportunities uh, for rigorous education, like gifted and talented, like specialized high schools and academically matched uh, rigorous education to match high performing students. Uh, so as a way for uh, low income and disadvantaged students of all colors and races to 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 achieve. So that's on the academic front. But in terms of uh, you know, we also have a civil rights group uh, that, uh, that I'm part of, uh, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, which is a more civil Asian civil rights, you know, Chinese American civil rights based organization. And together, you know, we converge on, you know, on this uh, academic, you know, uh, protecting academic excellence and protecting merit, and and now pushing back against this uh, whole Marxist socialism on the critical race theory. You know, not many parents are aware of this. You know, but most parents work their jobs and take care of the children and not aware of the literature and, and the, the ideologies. And so we're starting to educate each other and other parents about this too. And one of the biggest changes in mindset that, you know, especially Asian parents who have come from countries where it's dangerous to get active politically is to encourage them that, you know, as citizens now, it is their right and and it's their own, you know, and it's uh, to fight for their own voices and their rights, you know, for equality. And then that's a big, you know, thing to do, but a lot of parents are, are activated. Um, so so we're, we're trying to, you know, keep, you know, grow that and get more participation uh, and lobbying as well uh, and into the government. So that's what we're also doing in New York. Awesome, that's great. Um, look, I know, I don't want to keep you guys too long. I know everyone's busy. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming on. I want to thank you, you know, Glenn, Ostra, Chin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ronald. I know you had to leave. Uh, if you want to send me any links, anything like that, I'll put them in the description when I release this. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And if you guys have any last words, please go ahead. Well, I would just like to reiterate moral courage. You know, it is such an important ingredient today in the real resistance to bullying, intimidation, and retaliation that's being used as weapons to silence. And just remember that we are creating today America's future. And so each one of us has a responsibility to rise with intellect and moral courage for all the values in which we believe. And so please, please harness that moral courage within yourself. And I would just say it's it's also moral courage and education. I mean, most people, the most people, when you when you cloak the, this movement with social justice and all these polite uh, 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 expressions, people say, oh, well, of course, I'm for, mo uh, for social justice. But if you educate people and, and say to them, I said, are you are you aware that that, that these are really Marxist? Uh, teachings that a lot of this is uh, the same underpinnings that uh, that that uh, that ended up killing a hundred million people in the 20th century. Would you would you then be in favor of the same philosophy? They said, "Well, of course not." Uh, so it's about education. It's about courage, uh, and it's about uh, and it's about standing up for uh, for the the uh, the principles 
uh, that this the country was was based on and that has worked so well for so many years. Thanks. Chen, if you have anything to add. Look. No, I, I think um, as we're seeing, you know, we've connected with uh, from New York to Virginia with Azra and Glenn and also with Ron in California. And, I, you know, there's also other, other school districts in other states that are also doing this. And, you know, I hear about Montgomery County in, in, in Maryland also doing things like this. Um, so, you know, which, you know, I think it's great that we are able to connect on social media and to grow kind of the consciousness and know that we're not alone. And, and I think that's an important message for parents that people across the country, parents and concerned citizens are concerned and pushing back you know, and, and growing. It's really a silent majority that's getting more vocal and hopefully we, we continue to do that. All right, once again, thanks a lot everyone. Thanks you guys and thanks everyone Thank for listening. You.